Good afternoon, everyone. Before I start to read the eulogies that my daughter-in-law, Dila, and my son, Nathan, read at the funerals of Dila's father and 16 months earlier of her mother, I just want to say a few words by way of introduction. Dila's parents, Dorothy and Sherwood, or Chef Franklin, were both profoundly disabled from birth due to cerebral palsy. I am surprised at how many people I have encountered who think it is a genetic condition. It is not. It occurs most often as the result of the deprivation of oxygen to the baby's brain at some point in the delivery process. Dorothy and Chef, as you will learn, lived out their married life in Brooklyn. Several years before their deaths, their disabilities progressed to where they needed more care than the home health aides provided by Medicaid. At that point, they moved to the Hebrew Home for the Aged in Rockville, Maryland, only a few miles from where Nathan and Gila live. The eulogies I am about to read are about two extraordinarily courageous individuals who fought against all odds to fulfill their vision of the life that they were determined to lead. And I'll start first with Gila's eulogy for her father. My father's existence on this earth for 85 years was a miracle. Sherwood Shep Franklin was born in May 1933 in Brooklyn, New York. He lived his entire life in his beloved, almost his entire life in his beloved Brooklyn. Brooklyn had no more loyal son than my father. His parents, Sam and Rose, named their son Sherwood Martin Franklin. Quite a mouthful for a Yiddish boy chick from Coney Island. <laughs> he was born prematurely, and he was to live the entirety of his life without the use of his hands, with an unsteady gait, and with slowed and slurred speech. At that time, many, if not most, children born with cerebral palsy were institutionalized. For whatever reason, my pick grandparents decided to raise their son at home. And how surprised they must have been when this profoundly disabled child began to speak, and they discovered that a brilliant, incisive mind was contained within that fragile physical frame. The doctors recommended that my parents' grandparents move to Coney Island near the beach because they felt that walking in the sand every day would strengthen my father's legs. So off they went to an apartment on West 23rd Street, right off the boardwalk. And what a childhood he had. In contrast to my mother, who was treated by her family as a fragile household, hot house flower, my father was just one of the gang. My grandparents family, the Wishners, were a tight-knit group, eight first cousins, including my dad, who spent nearly every Sunday together in Coney Island. My father's cousin Elaine, who was like a sister to him, recalled that when they all arrived at my grandparents' apartment, they would be given 25 cents and told to disappear. <laughs> they would all traipse off to Luna Park or in warmer weather to the beach. My dad was completely, seamlessly accepted as part of the gang. That inclusive, loving upbringing gave my father the foundation to achieve so much in life. That and a mother with an iron will. My grandmother Rose was a fierce advocate for her son. She fought for the school system constantly, ensuring that he received the proper academic instruction to meet his capabilities. It was an accepted fact within the family that my father would go to college and pursue a career of his choosing. Because my father could not use his hands, he wrote and used a typewriter with his toes or in graduate school had students who were paid by the university to take notes for him and to type up his research papers and his master's thesis. My father loved languages and picked them up very easily. He studied Russian and Spanish in college, and initially he worked as a freelance Russian translator. This, despite the fact that his father had barely escaped being drafted into the Russian army 
and he tested everything Russian. That was my father, always marching to the beat of his own drum, expressing a ferociously strong personal will, eclectic intellectual vision, and always, always the contrarian. While he was in college, he met my mother through the Federation for the Handicapped, a social organization for young adults with disabilities. Their disabilities were completely symbiotic. My father had no use of my hands, so my mother fed him, helped him with all of his activities of daily living, and kept an immaculate home. She had a severe speech impairment that rendered her unintelligible to most others, so he was her translator to the world, her breadwinner, her advocate. She was his hands, and he was her voice. Together, they created a powerful, complete unit built on fierce love, incessant mutual nagging, strong Jewish values, and a shared determination to take on anything and anyone that stood in the way of the life vision they had for themselves. To the shock and opposition of many, that vision included parenthood. My father spent his entire life trying to prove that he could achieve anything that a non-disabled person could. That included having a child. Like my parents, my existence on this earth was far from a given, and yet here I am, the ultimate proof of my father's proclivity to tell those who doubted him or challenged him to go to hell. He was a feisty one. He had to be. He overcame enormous obstacles, natural and man-made, most of his life. When I was two years old, my father realized that he would not be able to support a family on freelance work, so he took the civil service exam and attained an entry level with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Had he merely done that, it would have been enough but he was determined to improve himself and be promoted to higher GS levels. So he went back to school part-time, obtaining two master's degrees in government and urban planning at NYU. He woke every morning at 4.50 a.m., took the bus and subway into Manhattan, worked a full day at HUD, and then took the D train down to Greenwich Village for night classes at the Wagner School of Public Policy. Week in, week out, year after year. On weekends, he was so exhausted that he slept most of the day away. There are many able-bodied people who could not have kept up this schedule and accomplished so much. Thanks to his fortitude and good judgment, my mother and I never had to worry about keeping a roof over our heads food on the table, or health insurance. Although the federal government was the most practical and hospitable employer for people living with disabilities, it was not a walk in the park. Things became particularly tough during the Reagan administration when a mandatory workforce reduction was imposed on HUD, and my father, along with many other employees, was demoted and transferred to a new unit with a supervisor who treated him horribly. It was only when Nathan and I moved my parents to the Hebrew home here in Maryland and closed up the apartment in Brooklyn that I read through the files regarding his grievances that he had filed. And what I read broke my heart. A union report written in support of my father stated that my father's supervisor had, quote, shown an almost physical disgust with the grievance persons and his professional efforts and has taken discriminatory personnel actions against him. He does not understand that the grievance difficulties in movement and communication are the result of the condition. He prefers to treat him as clumsy and stupid if he treats him as there at all. Another union appeal simply stated, Sherwood Franklin will not be infantilized. To survive his trials, my father had to develop a fighter's outlook. He had a reflexive aversion to anyone trying to limit his independence, 
and he often took umbrage when none was attended. He could be incredibly consumed by his own struggles and needs, and he was as demanding and judgmental of his child as he was of himself. He was not always easy to get along with. I now understand that so much of that came from his struggles and the limitations and indignities that were imposed on him. But my father was so much more than his disability, more than the sum of his achievements and his accumulated psychic wounds. Amazingly, despite all that he endured, he was an incredibly joyful life force with an expansive mind and spirit that took him and me way beyond the limits of his physical reach. Cerebral palsy was one important part of his identity, but it was equaled and perhaps surpassed by his Jewish soul. He was fascinated by Jews of different cultures and backgrounds and made sure I knew that there were Jews of all skin colors who spoke a multitude of languages and had a dizzying array of Jewish customs and traditions. He adored Jewish history and was fascinated by Jewish genealogy. He taught me there was so much to learn from cemeteries just by walking around and reading the headstones. He wanted to expose me to different cultures and faiths. Whenever he saw a particularly beautiful church, he would take me inside to appreciate the magnificent architecture and artwork. He would take me on long bus rides traversing the entirety of Brooklyn from north to south, passing through the modern Orthodox, Caribbean, Haitian, Latino, Hasidic neighborhoods, crossing over the Williamsburg Bridge and disembarking on the Lower East Side. We would walk up and down those famous streets, stopping at Ratten's restaurant for a snack, and then heading on to Chinatown in Little Italy, where he would always buy me a cannoli at Ferrara's Bakery. He loved Asian art and he took me many times to the Japanese rock gardens at the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens. My father taught me how to write. He sat with me weekend after weekend, helping me with essays for school and printing upon me his distinctive poetic word selection and sentence structure. He was a beautiful writer and I am sorry that he never took the toe to keyboard to write his own story in his own words, through his own eyes. It wasn't all serious issues with my dad. His razor sharp wit and quick tongue kept people charmed and entertained, and we had so many good laughs together. Long after his dementia had set in, Hebrew home staff members would observe that he retained a great sense of humor and that he was a master of the sardonic comeback. When I was a teenager, I would often exclaim in complete frustration, you are driving me crazy. Unfazed, he would kindly reply, one cannot drive what has already been driven. <laughs> <laughs> everything I am, everything that I do professionally and personally is because of my father. He was my teacher, my sparring partner, my best and worst influences, my greatest source of stress and aggravation, my inspiration, my guiding star in my heart. He was stubborn, exasperating, self-absorbed, brilliant, resourceful, passionately loving, funny, loyal, and always deeply in love with my mother, to whom he often said he owed his life. He adored his son-in-law, and he was endlessly proud of and delighted by his grandsons. Now it is up to me, to Nathan, that's my son, that's our son, and to our children to uphold his legacy. So, Josh, Gabe, and Rafi, our grandsons, I want to share with you the most important lessons that I think we can all learn from Saba, that's the Hebrew for grandfather, from Saba's life. Maybe one day, one of you will write a book, number one. Of course, the obvious, grit, courage, perseverance, resilience, even and especially at those moments when you feel you just don't have it in you, because you really do. Two, do your part to fight for the fundamental rights of each person to live in dignity and safety and to realize their greatest aspirations. Three, 
government service is a noble endeavor. Saga was very proud to be a federal employee. Don't let anyone ever tell you that government is the problem. It is the people who seek to diminish our government who are the problem. Four, New York is the best city in the world and Brooklyn is by far the best borough of the five. <laughs> five, it is okay to be so moved by prayer or by art that you are brought to tears. In fact, it is desired. Six, people are the most fascinating thing in the world. Take time to talk to them. In fact, to find out where they come from and to listen to their personal stories. Seven, don't be afraid to try new things and to drag others to try it with you, even if it exasperates it, your wife and your daughter beyond any measure. <laughs> Eight, uh, most importantly, live life loudly and proudly. Shout your love and affection to the rafters. Embrace all of life's blessings with zest and joy and laugh your heart out. It is the best medicine of was a eulogy that Kira, our daughter-in-law, wrote for her father at the time of his funeral, which was about five years ago. Sixteen months before that, her mother passed away. And this is the eulogy that she wrote for her mother. I'd like to take you back in time to a completely different world. June 1933. Bronx, New York, where a young woman is struggling through an arduous labor. She delivers an infant that the medical staff believe to be stillborn. In their haste to minister to the mother, they quickly dispense with the baby girl, placing her in some type of basket or receptacle. After several moments, a cry is heard, and the doctors and nurses realize that this baby is indeed alive. That baby, of course, was my mother. And as the story goes, her cerebral palsy arose from the difficult birth and from the traumatic brain injury she sustained due to being thrown into the basket. This birth narrative of an abandoned baby crying from a basket to let everyone know that she is alive exemplified my mother to a T. Until her last days on earth, she was a ferociously determined person with a tremendous energy for life, demanding to be heard, not to be dismissed, and to be a part of the vibrating pulse of humanity. Cerebral palsy is a neurological birth defect impacting motor and speech skills. My mother had a lifelong severe speech impairment that made it difficult if not impossible for her to be understood by most people. It was almost like she spoke a different language, and my father and I were the only two other people on the planet who were fluent in that language. As a result of this speech impairment and of her severe walking gait and limited fine motor skills, she was often either ignored or mistaken for someone with limited cognitive abilities. She was much more isolated in her life than she should have been and than she ever wanted to be because by nature she was an extremely warm, friendly, gregarious, funny, and wise person. Born in the 1930s, most babies born with severe disabilities like my mother's would have been institutionalized or otherwise hidden from the world. To their credit, my grandparents took my mother home, showered her with love and family support, and tried to give her as normative a life as possible. She was sent to the local public schools, but unfortunately, she was passed through without ever really learning because it was assumed that she couldn't learn. My father taught her to read when she was an adult. She was an only child and was extremely close to both of her parents but particularly to her mother, after whom I am named. Tragically, her mother died at the young age of 49 when my mother was 22 years old. She never really got over this loss. 
the two defining moments of her life were the death of her mother and the birth of her daughter. Even as a young adult, my mother's resilience was in full force. As an only child after her mother's death, it was up to her to become the homemaker for her father. She continued to attend all of the social and other programming for disabled persons that her mother had connected her to. And it was at the Federation of the Handicapped that she met my father's chef. When my mother announced that she was getting married, her family, particularly her father, discouraged her. They were concerned that my mom and dad would not be able to hack it on their own, that my father would not be able to financially support my mother. She ignored the naysayers, and on Thanksgiving Day, 1959, they were married. My mother had bigger plans than marriage. She intended to be a mother, just like other women her age. But her father and stepmother deeply opposed it. And for years, she was afraid to take this huge step without family support. Eventually, her maternal instinct overrose her fear, fears. And after nine years of marriage, she became pregnant. Her father and stepmother were so opposed to the pregnancy that they petitioned Brooklyn Jewish Hospital to allow an abortion to be performed. Those were the days prior to Roe versus Wade, when getting a legal abortion involved a difficult process. When informed that her abortion had been approved, she politely but firmly said, no thank you. She, she would laugh to hear it, but my mother was one of the great feminist warriors. Through the life she lived, she demonstrated the profound importance of human self-determination. No one is going to manipulate her reproductive choices and try to control her body. She was determined to be in charge of her own fate. In a society that at that time tolerated and even condoned the routine sterilization of physically and cognitively disabled people, my mother stood up for her. It is true that my mother spent her entire life showing up the legions of people who underestimated her, but that was not the stuff of her daily life. She was a lovely Jewish wife and mom, a New Yorker through and through, family, love, laughter, and Yiddishkeit were the cornerstones of her extraordinary life. She was a very proper, dignified person. Her house was always immaculate and beautifully decorated. She was always dressed well. She taught me that even if one only has the money for three garments, one must take care of them, keep them clean and pressed, and wear them with pride. Each Friday, she would go to the beauty salon to get her hair done in the usual Brooklyn Jewish helmet head coif. She would then go to our local bakery to get a challah and desserts for Shabbat. She maintained strict order in her daily routines in order to assert as much control over her life as she could. Monday was meat, Tuesdays was fish, Wednesdays was meat, Thursdays was dairy, and on Friday we had steak for Shabbat dinner because it was easier and faster for her to cook than chicken. She did not bake because her fine motor limitations made it difficult for her to measure ingredients, but she was a very good cook. I'm, in many ways, my mother's fa family and my father's family lost touch with my parents' cousins after one of their grandparents had passed away. With the exception of one or two cousins who kept in touch via mail and phone, in many ways, the Jewish community became their family. My mother was not one for prayer. Her Jewish identity found expressions in the traditions she maintained and in how she raised her child. The kosher home, weekly Shabbat meals, strict observance of Passover, sending her daughter to Jewish day school through the 12th grade, these were the cornerstones of her life. My mother had the warmest, most vibrant personality. When she was happy or amused, her bright blue eyes would twinkle. She loved to laugh, she loved to hug people. 
Yesterday, one of my good friends told me that he will never forget meeting my mother at my wedding. She greeted him so affectionately that she immediately made him feel like a member of our family. She adored my friends and was always happy to hear good news about their joys and her heart ached for them when they had troubles. Despite her difficulties in communicating, in the 18 months that she resided at the Hebrew home here, she established such warm, loving relationships with all of the caregivers. On the day she died, staff members from the nursing manager to the maintenance staff were in tears and came to her room to hug me and console my father. They knew her as the boss who called all the shots in Watson and Room 545 and also as the person who said thank you for every small thing that was done for her. Most of all, she adored her family. I always said that she liked me fine, but she loved her son-in-law, Nathan, and her three grandchildren were the lights of her life. One of the happiest moments she ever experienced was when our eldest son, Josh, was bar mitzvah. She was over the moon with joy, and she had such a blast at our party that night. Several people commented to me that they delighted in seeing my mother happily dance in her wheelchair to Uptown Funk at the celebration. <laughs> she was such a fun, funny person. During the last years of her life, my mother commented to me from time to time that she thought her parents would have been very proud of all she accomplished. It brought her such quiet satisfaction to know that she had thumbed her nose at everyone who underestimated her because of her disability. To her last day, she was sharp as a tack. I am bereft without her. I saw her almost every day at the Hebrew home, and I longed for kibbutz with her again, to hear her voice telling me that Donald Trump is, is an idiot, that my hair is too long and I need a haircut, that my outfit was gorgeous, just gorgeous, and that her grandsons were brilliant and funny and completely perfect, except when they were fighting or not listening to their parents. I do not believe in an afterlife, but for my mother's sake, I am hope that I am wrong. I badly want to envision her having been reunited with her mother and her father, no longer enduring the physical suffering she experienced for years prior to her death. It is difficult for me to express in a sh few short sentences the enormity of what my mother achieved in her 82 years. Cerebral palsy from birth, she came into a world at a time when most disabled infants were institutionalized or otherwise neglected. Her parents chose a different path and she was raised in a loving environment in New Bronx, New York. My mother overcame enormous hardships, physical and otherwise, to make a beautiful life for herself and her husband and her daughter. Her courage to live the life she wanted, despite the opposition of so many, has always been an inspiration to me and to so many others. I want to show a few pictures, and then I'm going to go on to my son's eulogy for her father, and I think I will hold them up and then pass them around because the, this is being recorded, so people may want to see it if they watch. There so this is their wedding, and if you look closely, you can see the hands that we refer to. So if you'll pass it around. This is my daughter-in-law and Dorothy, her mother, delighting in their, her daughter. And you can see the helmet head, by the way. And this is um, Chef. And you can see how he has to hold his daughter because he can't hold her with his arms. And this is them as a family, just a regular family, enjoying a day in the park. Sorry, I have to leave. That's okay. And we'll fast forward to the birth of their first grandson and our first grandson also. 
Whoops, thank you. And that's my son in the picture. And here's Dorothy with the first grandson. What a tribute. And here's the team. <laughs> Shep with three grandsons and my son, our son. And you haven't seen my daughter-in-law yet. So here's a picture at our grandson's graduation and Gila Franklin, Seagull. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about Nathan's eulogy because there's a part in it that I think will shock you. I'm well aware that I came late to the one-of-a-kind party that, as Gila described, was the tiny but resilient Franklin family. So I thought I would share just a few memories of my time with Chet, or Pop as I always called him to add just a bit to the celebration of his extraordinary life. I still remember what must have been almost the first words I exchanged with my future father-in-law almost 23 years ago, which would be now about 28 years ago. Dealer and I had recently started dating, and at its most basic, it was girlfriend invites boyfriend to meet the parents. And she had, of course, told me about them, but I don't think that anything could really prepare you for the extraordinary experience of walking into 3020 Avenue Y, apartment 4B in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn for the first time. When you first walked in, you saw exactly what I would come to understand my future mother-in-law worked so hard to keep and was deservedly her pride and joy. A lovely, classic, immaculately maintained two-bedroom Brooklyn apartment that had likely changed little since the 1970s with the plastic on the furniture, <laughs> the shag carpeting, and the lithograph paintings of elderly rabbis or women lighting candles. But then you meet the two people who lived in this typical Brooklyn home, this anything but typical, profoundly disabled couple who along with Gila proceeded to chat freely with each other in a language that when her mother spoke seemed completely foreign. Chef's speech is slow and slurred, so I had to concentrate a little harder than usual to make it all out. So, I hear you're from North Carolina, he asked. Yes, I said, I grew up in Durham. Well, he said, you know, we have cousins in Louisville. <laughs> <laughs> My first reaction at the time was, well, he may be disabled, but he's still another parochial New Yorker. <laughs> but over time, I came to understand how, in another sense, his response actually expressed something that was anything but parochial. Physically, he rarely ever left the New York area his entire life. Traveling was simply too impractical to negotiate. But his curiosity knew no such limits, and so he studied and traveled the world from the confines of his apartment. I think part of what he was trying to communicate to me was that no matter where I might have been, he could find some way to relate to it, and almost always that was true. Another one of my most treasured memories is just watching the three Franklins converse or sometimes just my in-laws. Gila talked about how Shep knew at least four languages, arguably more, but she left out a very important language that they both share, which is that they are both fluent in understanding Dorothy. Gila's mother's speech was to others completely unintelligible, but both, both Gila and her father understood her perfectly. And while for Gila, it was one of her birth tongues, for Shep, it must have been yet another one he learned to master as an adult. And it is not an easy one. I consider myself fairly good with languages, 
and I knew Dorothy for 20 years. If I thought it a good day, if I caught maybe 25% of her words and guessed maybe some of the rest. That a woman with unintelligible speech found another disabled man with an unusually acute ear for language, maybe another of life's minor miracles. But it also just one example of the kind of devotion that Shep had for my mother-in-law. Dela has eloquently explained many of the challenges her parents faced throughout their lives. But I think she probably would agree that Shep's last 25 years were especially difficult. By the early 90s to 1990s, he had worked for the federal government for about 20 years, and he was only about five or six years away from being able to retire on a comfortable pension. But the aging process, earlier and with more difficulty for people with neuromuscular disabilities like cerebral palsy and life expectancy is much less than the 85 years he lived. At age 59, Shep's spine took a dramatic turn for the worse and required life-threatening experimental surgery. Uh, I'll just add my own words here. He was told that this would either be successful or he would die and he made the choice that he did not want to continue to progress in the way he would have without the surgery. Thank God it was successful. He survived that, but it could not repair what had already occurred. And so from that point on, he required personal care to perform most basic tasks of daily living and had to take an early disability retirement. Shortly thereafter, Gila's mother fell and broke her arm and also started to need similar personal care. Given how expensive such care is, they had no choice but to essentially become indigent in order to qualify for Medicaid, which fortunately in New York has a generous home care pro program. Looking back at it now, it is truly remarkable that my in-laws were able to remain in their home for more than 20 years after that point. And while Gila and I certainly played a significant role in that, the same combination of iron determination and resourcefulness that Shep had relied on throughout his life played no small part as well. When I first met him, he was determined to find a way to go back to work. He worked a state vocational training program and basically taught himself to use a Windows-based personal computer by placing a large trackball mouse and a keyboard on the floor next to each other. He then moved his right foot back and forth between them, using his toes to move the cursor into place and then type on the keyboard. He never returned to work, but he never stopped dreaming. I mentioned that my mother broke her arm. Well, notwithstanding our skepticism, and by the way, they're both attorneys, Nathan and Gila, my father-in-law managed to find a lawyer, sued everyone in spitting distance of the sidewalk crack where she fell, and ended up with a six-figure settlement, which helped to pay their rent and major bills for some years. Fast forward to 10 years ago. It appeared that the time had come when the state was no longer going to be willing to provide the level of care, home care, that they needed. Shep managed to befriend a social worker at NYU who helped get them into a special waiver program that kept them in their home another five years. That was sort of fitting, and here I was shocked when I learned this. That was sort of fitting, because 40 years earlier, when Gila was born, the city had ruled that she had to be placed in foster care. Since her parents did not have the manual of this dexterity to care for an infant, Shep managed to befriend a young lawyer fresh out of law school, Danny Myers, who worked pro bono to work out a deal whereby the city provided a nanny for the first five years of Gila's life. He knew how to put that charm of resource and resourcefulness of his to good use. Of course, in some ways, 
it is easy to wax nostalgic at a funeral service. But we all know that real life is more complex than that. And my father-in-law was certainly no exception. The truth is that the very qualities that allowed Chef Franklin to succeed in his life far beyond any reasonable expectations often made it very difficult to be his child and even his son-in-law. For him, it was an absolute article of faith that his disability caused him to function no different than anyone else performing the same task for him. Without that faith, I doubt he would ever have had the will to live independently, get married, have a child, get an advanced education, and work a steady job to support a family. But at the same time, his reality was never that simple. As the only non-disabled member of the family from a very young age, Dila's parents necessarily depended on her in ways that psychologically inverted the parent-child relationship without ever acknowledging that reality. And that never really changed at any point in their lives and applied equally to me after I entered the picture. As a result, when I met Dila, I would mostly have described her relationship with her father as pretty tense, with plenty of justified resentment of the norm, enormous demands placed on her without any recognition or appreciation of that reality. And yet, despite all of that, there was something about my father-in-law that is hard to reduce to a few words, but made both of us not just admire his achievements in some objective sense, but genuinely love him. And that causes me to feel that knowing him for the 23 years that I did will always be one of the great privileges of my life. Maybe it was the warmth he exuded, his sense of humor, his general delight every time one of us would walk into the room, his endless fascination with all things seemingly arcane or some combination of all of the above. But whatever it was, I think Pop's life mission to prove that he could do anything anyone else could succeeded in the most profound way possible. He had a wife of more than 50 years who loved him dearly, warts, warts and all. He leaves a daughter whose love and loyalty is plain for all to see. A son-in-law who will be a lifetime season ticket holding fan of his and three adoring grandchildren who already look for opportunities to tell his story to friends, teachers, classmates, and beyond. He may have started out as the slowest of the eight first cousins Gila mentioned, but few of them finished the game of life and even close to where he did. So Pop, I know that in life you always felt restless. You felt you were always held back and never succeeded in doing what seemed to come so easily to others. But in the end, you were the one who showed so many others the way. I hope you are resting in peace because you have earned as much a right as you to do that. Thank you very much.